Hi, I'm Max Blumenthal in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club for the Washington Report for Middle East Affairs conference exploring Israel's influence and asking whether it's good for America. This conference is meeting just days ahead of the annual summit of AIPAC, the main arm of the pro-Israel lobby in Washington, and every presidential candidate will speak at AIPAC except for Bernie Sanders, which is an interesting development. Another fascinating development is that there will be a protest walkout of Donald Trump. And so this is a very interesting time right now for the U.S.-Israel special relationship, and we're going to talk to speakers here about it. So we're with Kirk Beatty. Uh, you wrote a book about uh, Congress and the Israel lobby, and you've been following this for a long time. How do you think, uh, do you think that, that anything's changed over the last 10 or 20 years uh, since you published your book? Uh, well, actually, I think that uh, uh, quite a bit is uh, shifting in a, in a positive direction in many regards, and that there are a lot of uh, topics that were absolutely taboo before. The appearance of groups like uh, J Street, for example, have made a difference in that the staffers that I interviewed for my book have argued that uh, it's given them uh, wiggle room uh, uh, and, and, and cover to their bosses the, is the term that they keep using uh, in a way that they did not have beforehand. We're with Kristen Sremsky, and Kristen is... You know, I mean, you're, lo you're in Washington lobbying for American Muslims for Palestine. You're on Capitol Hill. You talk to Hill staffers. Um, is it true that they secretly hate the Israel lobby? I don't know if I would go that far. I've run into a few who actually have very strong feelings about it. Some are pretty savvy. They won't say. I think they get annoyed, let's be honest. I think they really get annoyed. And they tell us that they're constantly being bombarded with information from the Israel lobby and they want to start hearing from people advocating for Palestinian human rights. You know, Monday you have this big event with APAC is, is basically dismantling the principle of democracy because they're waging, you know, a war on diversity, but basically what they are saying, we can buy whatever we want. Your policies belong to us. Where, where, where are we now? Because a few years ago we were so hopeful um, about the Arab Spring maybe leading to Jerusalem. My hope is not from uh, the Arab nation somehow. The main actor in uh, aborting the Arab Spring was Saudi Arabia, who financed every coup in the region because they were so concerned that the arrival of democrat democratic system will reach Jordan, Riyadh, and people will start demanding more inclusive and negotiated system. Look, it took the American Constitution to be ratified seven years until the Battle of Yorktown. I don't know how long it will take the Arab nations to become more inclusive, but I think now there's something that happened with the, with the Iran deal that will force the region, and they produce no stability, Saudi Arabia. It's only a liability. It's time to break that bond. Now you've seen it from the inside. We met when you were driven off of MSNBC for pointing out that U.S. media is biased towards Israel. It seems obvious. It's like saying water's wet and the sky is blue and uh, Judas told the Romans where Jesus slept. A CNN executive admitted that he helped write Netanyahu's speech to Congress. Exactly. And then um, when I'm invited in CNN or in any other network, they always call me very worried. So why are you going to talk about? What are you... And they are so worried to tell the audience the truth about what's going on because they know that this will lead to shift in public opinion but because of people like yourself of because of alternate it's because of salon it's because of uh, intercept it's because of mondo wise it's because of these amazing electronic groups. intifada electronic intifada and ali abu Na'ma, who actually started all of this movement and part of this movement and without these voices incredible voices I mean, I would have been shunned aside and disappeared in, in uh, you know, in, in, I, I would have become a ghost probably. But today they cannot ignore these voices. These people obviously, I shame them in public, they couldn't take it, they're, you know, they're busy with petty small things and now they're all shocked that we have Donald Trump. But they paved the way for Donald Trump and that Islamophobia, racism misogyny, that culture has been there and they've been bred and cultivated by major analysts in this country. So it doesn't define me what happened in that episode, but it defines its shameful, uh, you know, stain on MSNBC forever. Well, we got to get you on camera. Oh, okay. I don't know if you should eat. Um... Oh, sorry.
Why do you focus on the New York Times and why is it so important for you to keep battering the New York Times at Mondo Weiss and being this, this constant critic? I think that the New York Times sets the agenda for American media and especially on this issue, people wouldn't want to go outside the lines of the Times. So if the Times said tomorrow that uh, Israel has failed and uh, Jewish state was a bad idea, that would just be like, you know, everyone would say, oh, I always thought that and now I can say it. Correct me if I'm wrong, the New York Times has never published a feature length kind of public interest style piece on the pro-Israel lobby. I, I think you're right. I've never seen it. And I think I would know about it if it ever had. I, it's done, it's referred to the Israel lobby or pro-Israel lobby in articles, but no, they have never run a feature length major takeout on that Israel lobby. So it, it's, failed its, it's failed its mission as a journalistic institution. But you might argue that it succeeded in its mission. I'm not entirely conspiratorial because I believe that the same forces that are acting on Jewish life across this country with young Jews questioning the need for a Jewish state and the militant behavior and uh, uh, racist behavior of Israel, that's happening at the Times too, but I think that they're silent right now. I mean, uh, you look at it, 10 years ago, um, they shut down the Rachel Corey play in New York. That, was, that happened 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Walton Mearsheimer came out with their book. That was shut down. Well, guess what? 10 years later, they're shutting down another Palestinian play in New York, and they're still not covering the Israel lobby. Okay, so you can say nothing's changed in some ways. The establishment discourse hasn't really changed, but we are attacking them from so many angles. The neocons arose because of all these countercultural elements in the 60s and 70s that were actually going to threaten Israel. And a lot of the black power movement did actually threaten the uh, discourse around Israel. And they shut it down then in the 70s. They're not going to be able to do it this time. I don't think, th I think the discourse is too open to uh, radical, left wing, uh, people of color. It's just too diverse a discourse to survive, for Israel to survive in the United States. I mean, I received a <laughs> call and a threat from uh, somebody who identified themselves as Christians United for Israel. Uh, saying that if I came to Rochester, they were going to blow me away in the name of Christ. I felt it was very important to go anyway, so I announced that we were going to go anyway to Rochester and, and do what we set out to do, which is to talk about uh, the occupation, to talk about Palestine, to collect, connect the dots uh, between Ferguson and, uh, and Palestine and, and the occupation. And, you know, the connecting the dots between Ferguson and Palestine really means building black Palestinian solidarity. Uh, which is really the nightmare of the pro-Israel lobby. I think it's something that they've done in the past is really publish, pu punish black public figures like Danny Glover, for instance, who speak out for Palestine. Why is it such a threat to the pro-Israel lobby? And, and, and do you see solidarity increasing? What do you see happening out there? Well, I mean, one of the things in terms of the neutralization of the black community, basically the Jewish community has kept alive the myth of the solidarity that they had with the black community in the civil rights movement. Well, the civil rights movement, when we look at that, that was in the 60s. Uh, but since then, there has also been orchestrated efforts to dismantle affirmative action by the Jewish community, while at the same time holding on to the idea that they are somehow the black community's best ally. Well, the reality is, is that we stood up uh, against apartheid in South Africa, and so that we are, are commanded by history to stand up against apartheid uh, in, the, in the West Bank and to uh, continue to stand with Palestinians who are facing the victimization of occupation. We can't do anything less than that if we're standing on the right side of history. So, do you think, which way is the arc of history trending? Are we going towards justice? It is bending towards justice. It's like, a, it's like a slow bend. Well, it's a slow bend, but anything that really is built, it's, everything that we have, have done has been built over time. South Africa did not happen overnight. When, when, when I first started in South Africa, I was in school. I was called in by the president, basically threatened with being expelled from school if I continued to stand up and advocate against apartheid in South Africa 
because they said that I was supporting communists at the time. I mean, so that has been a long pendulum. And now everybody will claim that somehow they were on the right side of the corner, except for Ronald Reagan, of course, on the right side of the corner in terms of dismantling apartheid, just like everybody marched with King in the Civil Rights Movement. We know that that's a myth, that's not the reality, but we also know that when we continue to stand up one by one, eventually it becomes two by two, and eventually becomes the multitude that is needed to change the whole paradigm. Thanks a lot. Max Blumenthal for the Real News Network.